Jesus Christ, this story is insane. Remember how the terror police burst into my producer's house, deliberately assaulted his mum, girlfriend, and dog, and then, straight after, yelled at them, lied, point blank to them. I tripped over you. And then it was exposed in Parliament that the fixated persons unit, I'm guessing led by Detective Sergeant Matthew McQueen, forced probably a very long-suffering police prosecutor to try and put me in jail for contempt of court without getting any proper legal advice beforehand, all because I dared say, hang on, bursting into my producer's house deliberately assaulting his mum, girlfriend and dog to arrest someone for YouTube videos, surely that's not what the terror police are for. Not just that, you did a dumb impression of me. I don't come to work to have my actions scrutinised. And then it was revealed Detective Sergeant Matthew McQueen didn't even bother to check the law before trying to throw me in jail for criticising him. New South Wales Parliament exposed that he didn't even have a warrant for my producer Christo's arrest. Not only that, he didn't even bother to follow his own protocols. He just got a call claiming that the Deputy Premier was stalked at a funeral, couldn't be f to collect any other evidence, didn't even bother to maybe speak to other people at the funeral to see if Christo was even at the funeral, just drove straight to Christo's house and arrested him. Job well done. Another dangerous criminal off the street, eh? So I know that this might be hard to believe, but did you know that others have alleged Detective Sergeant Matthew McQueen isn't the most ethical cop in Australia? Evidently, the New South Wales Police have had a hard time believing that. Isn't that an indictment on the current leadership and structure of the New South Wales Police, despite having clear-cut evidence of an assault and an admission that McQueen failed to follow protocol. McQueen's still out there with a badge and gun, I'm guessing attempting to solve the mystery of why David Elliott's postman keeps coming to his house. He's come around again. This guy's like clockwork. Oh no, he's dropped a letter bomb. What a sociopath. Oh, f he saw me. I forgot to use my inside voice. If one of my employees committed just one of the multiple f ups that McQueen has clearly committed, they'd be fired instantly. But the New South Wales Police, the very people meant to be upholding the law in this state, haven't done anything to ensure a violent thug in their ranks is held to the same standard as an ordinary Australian. But I've got some good news for New South Wales and some very bad news for Queenie. Maybe after this video they will. I'm so sorry for all the why references, but honestly, this story is just too perfect to forgo them. You remember the first episode of The Wire and like the second scene with Stringer, the second in command of the drug ring, sits in court and makes sure that the witnesses to a murder that D'Angelo, one of his boys did, gives the exact testimony needed to exonerate D'Angelo. Well, all this time I thought McQueen was the slow and clumsy cop Herc, but now I realise that the characterisation was a little too charitable. Herc at least has a good heart. McQueen, more or less, is a mix of the nastiness of Strigger Bell and the stupidity of Herc. Okay, sorry, no more wire references. To people who don't watch the show, that was just a very long way of saying, Matthew, next time you appear to have very, 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 very vivid conversations with witnesses in the foyer of a court, just before they testify in a case, a case that you botch the investigation of, it might be a better idea to do it out of the view of a CCTV camera. Just a thought. Okay, to understand this story, I have to give you a brief outline of the court case. The alleged criminal in this case is a man that will just codename Rob. Now, how this all starts is that Rob's children go to Wallara Primary, where Rob, rightly or wrongly, believes there to be a bullying problem. The long and the short of it is, Rob sends emails to the school in an attempt to sort out the problem, but not much really happens. Rob keeps contacting the school enough to set off enough alarm bells at the school for them to spring into action. Rob believes this is because they saw him as a potential litigant. But I still don't know why the following happened. This is just background info to help you understand the main part of the story. The principal gets in contact with a man called Alex Sackers, who is a kind of Department of Education's go-to guy in the cops. Sackers then sticks the fixated persons unit onto Rob, which is led by the competent, calm and cool-headed bad boy of the streets, Matthew McQueen. According to the info I've got from the people I've spoken to, McQueen's job appeared to be following around Rob for months, thinking of strategies of how to arrest Rob for literally anything. At one point, the cops got Rob for jaywalking. Not making any value judgments on Rob's character, I don't know the guy, could be a dickhead. But you see the similarities with Barillaro? The fixated persons unit were following us for months, months before they arrested Christo for a crime he didn't commit 
That's how desperate they are. Weeks before Christo's arrest, they actually showed up to my house when I wasn't at home, hoping to arrest me. I only knew about it because my neighbor told me. My lawyer called them to ask why they were visiting my house and McQueen said they had a warrant for my arrest, but were still getting legal advice. Here's Mark Davis on Marcus Paul's show explaining what happened. I first became aware of it actually a few weeks ago. That's when I first sort of met the boys. There was an arrest warrant um, for Jordan, or rather police had come to his house. Yeah. Um, they asked me to call the police and find out what it was. Now, to my great surprise, I was put through to the fixated persons unit. Um, now, at that time, they then said they had a warrant, but they weren't going to issue it. Now, that's quite a thing to say to a journalist. You know, we've got a warrant from the fixated persons unit, but they're not going to execute it. We're just going to leave it hanging over you pretty much, right? And I asked them if they, they withdraw it to advise me if they wanted to um, execute it. Mm. I'd come in with Jordan. Are you getting a better idea of how the unit works? It's not a crime unit. It's not even a future crime unit. McQueen's job is to take calls from senior bureaucrats and politicians about people they have grudges with, and then for McQueen to spend months of police time, hundreds of thousands of dollars of police resources spying on those people, attempting to pin them on even the smallest infraction. If you don't believe me, well, first off, we need a parliamentary inquiry into the fixated persons unit to truly understand the scope of their operations. But the case study of what they did to Rob bears many similarities with their other f**k-ups. McQueen spent from July to November of 2018 attempting to find a reason to arrest Rob. Rob was thrown on the suspect target management plan, which is essentially a future crime program. It's an algorithm that predicts who is most likely to commit crimes based on limited data sets. If you spend that much time fixated on someone, you're eventually gonna get something half good enough to at least charge them with. That's exactly what happened. After school, Rob was talking to his seven-year-old daughter who told him that she'd been kicked in the groin by a boy. Rob said, because the teachers weren't doing enough, you should just fight against the boy, which, you know, might not be the most politically correct parenting style, especially in a place like Willara, but I don't think that's a crime. Yeah, one of the teachers was there when it happened and claimed to McQueen that she heard Rob instruct his daughter to kick, not the bully, her. Claiming Rob said to his daughter, don't talk to her, never talk to her. If she talks to her, this is what you do to her. She then claimed she saw Rob move his leg in a kicking motion. You see how vague and quite frankly weak this evidence is? Well, it appears that even McQueen thought that as before Strike Force Premature went to arrest Rob, they had some correspondence with the teachers about the event in which McQueen sends this very telling email. I need to get some legal advice in regard to this incident. Rob may have committed an offence, incite someone to commit a crime, i.e. an assault. The only sticking point is Rob's daughter is seven and so she can't commit a crime. I'll speak to legal advice tomorrow. If they say it's okay, then we can work out a bail strategy so he can't come within the vicinity of the school. I can't see why mum can't drop the kids off to school. If they say no, I'll keep going with other strategies. I've completed a report to have a camera placed at the school. I just have to get it approved. So from this email, we know that even McQueen knows it's bullshit. Even if Rob did indeed tell his daughter to kick teachers, she was seven. Yeah, it's not really possible for a kick from a seven-year-old to be serious enough to constitute a crime. Even if Rob's character was so bad that it warranted surveillance from the FPU, the way they went about getting him was just wrong. It was incompetent and dangerous. If Rob is slash was a threat, I would have no problem with McQueen arresting him for actual crimes. But this is how desperate McQueen was to get Rob. He arrests him anyway and charges him with recruiting persons to engage in criminal activity. Now... This is where the case gets really strange. During the lead up to the trial, Rob's barrister has multiple phone calls with McQueen in which McQueen casually calls Rob a pedo. No evidence presented to his lawyer or the court. McQueen also claims he's investigating Rob for terrorism and queries Rob's barrister about Rob's background and why he lived in Wollara. Might be because McQueen was targeting Rob as if he was some sort of Islamic extremist and was confused as to why someone of his Middle Eastern background lived in the Eastern suburbs, which, could be completely fair enough, but only if you're targeting him for an actual crime. And this becomes even more absurd when you learn that Rob isn't Muslim, he's Druze, a religion that Islamic extremists hate, and McQueen was the same cop who spent a good 20 minutes in the police station yelling at Christo about how racist my videos were. Eventually, 
The trial comes around and because there's only one direct witness for a charge that really should have never gotten up in the first place, it would appear in order to get a conviction, McQueen has to ensure that he puts on the best show he possibly can for the magistrate. McQueen is there for the entire day that the witnesses from the school testify, moving in and out of the courtroom, talking to them in a group in a very animated way. We've obtained the CCTV footage of McQueen's interaction with the witnesses. It's been examined by an external professional editing consultant and clips have been put together that correlate with each other. Now, before I show you the vision, know that despite the fact that influencing a witness or a juror is a serious indictable offence that carries a 14 year prison sentence if convicted, that inference should not be drawn. Until properly scrutinised by the authorities, this footage is nothing more than circumstantial. Here is the single witness to the alleged crime testifying that she never heard Rob use her name when she alleged that Rob instructed his daughter to kick her, and here is McQueen sitting just below the camera in the courtroom. Notice the eye contact the witness gives to McQueen, swiftly followed by this hand movement by McQueen. Back and to the left. Back and to the left. This appears to happen again with another witness, albeit in a more subtle manner. McQueen is now sitting out of view of the camera and another witness gives eye contact while testifying and another person swivels to see why she's looking at McQueen. This is just a little bit of the footage. Here's McQueen in court watching Rob's counsel cross-examine a witness about the location where the event took place. And here's McQueen about three minutes later out of the courtroom appearing to mimic the exact events that took place in the courtroom to witnesses that are not supposed to have any knowledge about what is going on in the court. Granted, we don't know what McQueen's saying. For all we know, he could be saying, Look, teachers, me drew a horsey. Yet throughout the day, there's a few more of these occurrences that really make you wonder, how many coincidences are too many? We know from experience, if it were the other way around and McQueen was investigating something like this, it would only take one of these videos for him to charge into the offender's house with a SWAT team and accidentally pull the trigger spraying the house with bullets. Yet here at Friendly Geordies, we take our work a little more seriously and don't jump to conclusions. This clip is very circumstantial, but as Rob's lawyer is cross-examining the witness about the location the alleged offence took place, McQueen pulls out his phone and appears to text somebody. If you check the CCTV footage outside the court with the corresponding timestamp, another witness moves as if she's checking her phone. This is inconclusive, but a strange coincidence. Here's another instance of that same witness giving evidence, then McQueen mimicking her actions outside to other witnesses while she's still in the courtroom. I was facing in a diagonal towards Spartan Building, towards 4th Street, and my back was to the... This is a common occurrence throughout the day. Numerous times something will happen in the courtroom, and minutes later McQueen will be seen on CCTV talking to another witness, making remarkably similar gestures. Again, this could all turn out to be nothing more than circumstantial and Rob could be guilty of what's alleged, but it'd be wrong for me to sit on this footage. This footage deserves professional scrutiny, as after the testimony from these very witnesses, the magistrate convicted Rob of recruiting persons to engage in criminal activity. Yet after an appeal, Rob's conviction was not only quashed, but he was awarded costs as the judge found that McQueen had failed to undertake a reasonable investigation. As guess what? As obsessive as McQueen is, he failed to ask the one question to Rob's daughter that you'd think you'd ask if you were a cop that was worth promoting to sergeant. Did your dad tell you to hit and kick teachers? McQueen legitimately did not ask Rob's daughter that question once, despite interviewing her. It's almost as if he knew her answer wouldn't help his case. It's almost as if McQueen didn't actually care about the truth or the rule of law, but decided to play judge, jury and executioner in order to get a man that rightly or wrongly, he was fixated on. But how would you do that? To launch a successful case against someone with as little evidence as McQueen had, you'd have to really make sure your witnesses were going to say exactly what was needed to secure a conviction. That surely would be too difficult to achieve. Surely if you did that, someone would find out. But guys, it gets better. Because do you think McQueen marches around court and the other institutions he operates in without making enemies? No. 
How would you feel if you were a poor police prosecutor showing up to work hoping to prosecute real alleged criminals and McQueen, like a cat dropping rats at your feet expecting you to be pleased, time and time again, just brings you some guy that he's alleging is a terrorist because he made a YouTube video told his daughter to defend herself. Because it appears McQueen's MO in these cases isn't just to prosecute, it's to make the defendant's life as painful as possible. When he was arrested, Rob had a bunch of electronics, you know, laptops, phones, etc., seized from him by McQueen. An act in itself that was just incredibly unnecessary, as the electronics were not related to the charge whatsoever. But the standard operating practice for the seizure of electronics is that the cop hands it off, it gets examined by the state electronic evidence branch, and it's meant to come back three months max. McQueen arrested Rob, seized the electronics on the 23rd of November 2018. He only got round to dropping the electronics off to the electronics evidence people on the 6th of February 2019 and then received the intel on the 15th of May. He then requested that the police be allowed to keep the electronics until the end of Rob's trial. Obviously Rob objected. McQueen was then cross-examined to give a reason as to why his request should be granted. He claimed that the electronics team could not access Rob's phone due to the phone having a pin. Being asked, question. Can you tell us why they couldn't get into the phone? Then answering, answer, because the Celebrite equipment they had there didn't allow access to the phone. Then being asked further, question, do you know if there was something prohibiting them from accessing it? Answer, the pin number. He made this claim under oath to a justice in the Supreme Court. Why that's interesting is I have an email exchange between the police prosecutor to Rob dated September 2019 when the prosecutor finally returned Rob's phone. Rob asks, unnamed police prosecutor, you returned my phone yesterday. I connected it to the power charger and we both opened the phone without putting in a password. You agree this occurred? Then the prosecutor responds and bear in mind, this is from McQueen's own colleague. Yes, the phone I returned to you that day appeared to unlock without a passcode to the main screen slash home screen. On one reading, that really looks like an admission from the police prosecutor, an officer of the court, that a detective sergeant, his colleague, la Actually, I've gotten in trouble for pontificating on statements made under oath before, so I'm not gonna make any claims. But I am gonna make a request that the fixated persons unit face serious parliamentary scrutiny because even if their targets are deserving, even if this guy was a serial killer, it's a farce and an insult to the justice system that McQueen failed to ask the one question most pertinent to his investigation. That fact, in conjunction with the videos presented, raises serious, serious questions that need to be asked by someone much more qualified than me. I'll end the video with another wire quote, just for Maddie. It's some pretty sage advice, and I think it's incredibly relevant to your job. Think about it next time when you try and secure a conviction. Hey, yo, lesson here, babe. You come at the king, you best not miss. Like and subscribe, and sign up to our Patreon as if shit like this isn't worth your money. Please share and comment below. Comment. Hey, yo, lesson here, babe. You come at the king, you best not miss.